presidential threat. Oh, okay. <laughs> I wish I had one on hand for you. All right, we're just going to kind of go around the room with a question, so we're going to start right here. Okay, so I'm from Divergent Connection, and we were wondering for Well, I have never, not for a second, had any ambitions to be an actress. <laughs> so, um, for me, it was terrifying, actually. This uh, Neil Berger, our wonderful director, was like, okay, and you need to burst through this door and be breathless but excited. And I was like, you want me to be two things at the same time? Uh, anyway, it took a few takes. Um, <laughs> a few too many. Uh, but it was uh, it was really exciting and, and fun to see, you know, I mean, how often do you get to experience that? Like, never. Uh, well, for these guys, I mean, several times, at least. But uh, for me, never. So it was wonderful. And the tattoo was really sweet. It was like on my throat. Uh, which was, I don't know, it was a really special experience. That's all. <laughs> she killed it. <laughs> Not true at all. Totally <laughs> true. <laughs> This is for Veronica as well. Um, in terms of the screenplay, what role did you have in the screenplay? And were there any scenes that you said you know, really should be in the movie that are pivotal scenes? Not really. Um, I similarly like don't have any ambitions to be a screenwriter either. Um, so I kind of uh, left it to the people who know what they're doing. Um, but I guess I was open to being like a consultant. So they'd ask me about the world, and I would tell them you know, whatever they need to know. But other than that, I mean, I think it's important to just trust the people who you decide to work with and uh, to kind of let go a little bit because otherwise you'll go crazy. So I think they did a wonderful job, which is very good. But, yeah. Yeah, um, so I wanted to ask about the You mean like diverging from the mainstream? Yeah. I killed someone. Um and so I feel like you, you rock climb, that's pretty diverse. Or I guess that's Yeah, it's like kinda of dauntless. Yeah, I mean I, I rock climb a lot. Uh EO boxes. So I guess I guess maybe sometimes we're a little dauntless. But uh I, I think actually this is, I just came up with something kind of clever. Um, I think the most divergent thing that we do, especially us three, is be actors because, you know, if you're going along divergent, which is meaning, you know, every action, uh, as actors we have to be different people all the time, um, play different roles that are, you know, sometimes maybe more dollar, sometimes maybe more uh, erudite. So. You know, if I guess I never really think of it that way when I'm making it. When I'm doing a different movie, I'm not thinking, is this, which fashion would this come? <laughs> but you know, we're pretty, uh, we're pretty divergent as actors. Well right. said. That was damn well said. <laughs> <laughs> so glad I just came up with that. <laughs> um, my question's for Shailene. Um, what inspired you to write this book? You've done a couple of young adult book to film adaptations at this point. Do you know how devoted the fan bases can be? What is it about Tris as a character do you think that makes her such a powerful role model for the young fans? Um, I mean, in my opinion, I think Tris, is this incredibly loud for you guys? Because in my ear, it's like, wow. <laughs> Does it sound normal? Okay. Um, what I, I should speak for myself, and so what I found really um, beautiful and unique about Tris that sort of set her apart from other young adult heroines, quote unquote, is that the struggle between being selfless and compassionate and empathetic and being brave and courageous and going out into the world with a mission and accomplishing a goal um, was really beautiful. And I think that it's something uh, to look up to because um, there are so many things right now in the world that do need to sort of have some light shed on them. And to have somebody in in an action film, you know, which does have artistic license and is in, in a, a movie about entertainment, at the end of the day, there's a lot of powerful messages that come from being an empowered woman. And that was one thing that when I read the book, I really responded to. Is uh, you, there there are a lot of empowered females in films, um, 
but I feel like Tris, Tris isn't badass by nature. You know, she didn't, she wasn't born knowing how to do really, uh, in, uh, knowing how to survive in intense situations. She had to build her strength and she had to dig deep for her bravery and her courage. And I think that that's something that we could all sort of live up to or look up to. That probably made no sense. <laughs> I think we should clap after each question. <laughs> uh, how much uh, training was involved in the fight scenes, and did you do any of your own stunts? I did all my stunts and the other stunts. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Uh, yes, there was quite a lot. We we all got there before about a month, a month before the shooting, and we kind of got stuck in and uh, you know learned this new new style of fighting, which they came up with because the idea was to you know just have something reminiscent of how of what we know today, but have you know it to be a bit different because obviously it's in the future. Um, we had at one point the I kind of played general four in a way because we had this uh, we had a couple of days where everyone came in and. Uh, I kind of took them on a, a dauntless class, which was kind of funny. He made me do 20 push-ups in front of 50 strangers, because yeah. I laughed at him. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Shay was like, what are you serious at that point? But yeah, that was a big part of it, kind of, uh, you know, because I guess that's how dauntless defined their, their kind of, in a way, their physicality and their strength. Now you clap. What's the last story about? <laughs> Uh, did you guys, this is kind of a question for all of you, did you all have any particular issues with translating certain scenes from the book to the movie? Like, did, was there any particularly difficult scenes that didn't translate well, or ones that you wanted to get across? Um, no. I mean, yes. <laughs> yes, definitely. I feel like there is, you know, the book is, is has so many different things happening, you know, which is, it starts off with Tris switching factions, and then there's a storyline between four, and then there's a storyline uh, between her and Janine, and then there's her becoming Dauntless, and she to survive or not survive, and then, you know, sort of breaks out more. And so there's so many things that are happening that to translate that to the screen was, I think, a bit difficult for the screenwriters. And the script was sort of evolving as we were filming. So we had we had a baseline script, and, and we had most of the scenes, but there were, there were often times where you and I with the director the night before or the morning of would be like this. How do we how do we bring more truth to the situation? How do we bring it back to the book, uh, relate it back to the original storyline, um, but also <coughs> lend lend the movie its own creative process? You know, because they are two separate things. Yeah. Um, but yeah, it was sort of it was something we were constantly working on. And I think we realized that you know you. you there are some things you have to lose in the context of the making of a, a movie, um, you know, and in, sometimes in scenes there would be particular lines from the book, which was a poignant line, and, and you know, as much as we could, we tried to keep them in, but sometimes, for whatever reason, in order to be a different medium, uh, you know, we found that it needed to be communicated in a different way, so that was one of the lessons we learned. Or sometimes we look at a scene and be like, this scene isn't working, and then we go back to the book. That's and, true, yeah. and sort of translate that scene verbatim. Actually, we did that quite a lot. And yeah. we'd, look, we'd look at it, if, you know, if we, we were looking at a scene and thinking it's a section of it which feels like it's not real or it doesn't work, and we would go back to the book and look at the very scene. Uh -huh. <laughs> <laughs> I was kind of glad when they took some of the dialogue, actually. Because I I, when I heard the audio book for the first time, I remember hearing some of the lines out loud, and I was like, maybe not what someone would say. <laughs> <laughs> so. For me, it was like, oh, good. We can just like, and, you know, enjoy like the sense of what was being said instead of be like word for word translation of what was being said. I mean, that's way more important to me and has been throughout this whole process. Not seeing the book like scene for scene, word for word, character for character, replicated on the screen, but to have the general like thrust of the narrative and the um, and the characters remain uh, very close to how they were. And I think that you know was pretty much achieved, which is a good thing. But one thing I thought was probably a challenge. I didn't do it, so I don't know. It was the choosing ceremony must have been hard? Because that scene is entirely in Tris's mind, um, and it's a huge struggle. But uh, when I saw it, good job, Jim. Thanks, dude. <laughs> um, fun tip about, or thing about that scene is the first dude who goes up and cuts his hand is Neil Berger, our director's son. How sweet is that?
<laughs> and his daughter is in, the, in your fear center. And the daughter is the little girl who the dog tries to attack in the beginning. Uh, Neil, plug into this family. In the movie. <laughs> that guy, I tell you. I'm not going to be in the second movie. <laughs> <laughs> imagining how, how that could be. <laughs> Not really, no. I mean, I think I'm someone who's familiar with like fairly intense environments um, and competitive ones. But uh, other than that, I mean, that's really the only thing. And I mean, to say that with the caveat that like, you know, Barrington High School where I went to school and then uh, uh, Northwestern, but no one was trying to like punch me or stab me. So it's not like that intense. But I'm just saying, you know, feeling like that sort of pressurized and contained thing is sort of what translated to the book well. But other than that, I mean, it's just a <coughs> huge leap of imagination, I guess. Um, this is for Shailene and um, Theo. How did you, well, not how did you feel? Um, what is your opinion on fighting for sport versus fighting for self-defense? Uh, um, what do, is it morally, do I agree with it? Um, I guess that and just, um, like if you were in that type of situation, would you ever fight Would you be a fighter or a flyer? I, yeah, I did, I kind of, I, I'm a big boxing fan, so I'd say yes, I do. Um, I like the kind of, there's, there's strategy and there's a bit, there's art to, to fighting. I mean, there's obviously that side of it which seems brutal and kind of, uh, you know, Inhumane in a way, but there, there's a, it is also a sport, and there's quite a lot of strategy behind it. So yeah, I do. I'm a fan. I also think that there's something really about physical um, exertion, especially in the form of fighting, that humans get to release anger, um, whether it be with another green or on like a boxing bag or whatever it is. Uh, and that's often an emotion that I feel we don't release enough, and so we end up building it up, and I think a lot of tension and a lot of extra stress and a lot of uh, uh, negative situations come from pent up anger, and so as a sport, I think that there is a certain art and a certain emotional release that doesn't get uh, access very often. That is important, um, and I also think that if you know if your life it is leaving the sports conversation, but if your life depends on whether you're going to fight back or whether you're going to run away, I think that most of us at the table, or I think all of us actually, would choose like to fight. You know, to like fight to survive. And I run. know you I would. Run. <laughs> you would run, but if you were in a fight or flight situation, you would put up a good fight. Maybe. You're tough, Veronica. Thanks. Yeah. I'm tall. I can, I can just. <laughs> <laughs> That'll work in your advantage. Yeah, I'll totally be fine. Um, Jessica Hill, Hill Center. Um, how was it premiering Divergent last night in the home of Divergent? Like, was Love Anna? Yeah, it felt, it felt really it felt gratifying to kind of be back because it's quite a long journey. And it's very full circle. We came here on the 13th of March, so it's almost a year um, just from when we started the film. Um, so yeah, it felt good and it felt, uh, it, 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 as we said lots of times, it feels really gratifying to be in, in, involved in something that people are already invested in and or, already love. You know, the, the People ask whether there's a pressure there, but I think we've done our job now and we just we're proud of it and I hope people will relate to it um, and we're just, you know, excited to be be in a place where people are fucking out there. I'm not, I mean, in terms of watching the movie, but... <laughs> I mean, it's also cool because, I mean, I remember a bunch of you guys coming to set as fans and uh, I think as the movie went on and as you, you guys have obviously made these fan pages that have had huge followings and now you're here actually interviewing us. So, I mean, it's like, as the movie evolved, and now I remember my first car ride coming here, and, uh, you know, my second movie ever, and then my car ride coming here yesterday, there were billboards from Divergent everywhere. Mm -hmm. So the fan base and, you know, the movie have grown together, and, uh, you know, Chicago, I feel like, yeah, it's kind of like the hub of it, because, you know, that's where the first set stalking fans were. <laughs> <laughs> To me, it, it always, it's in a peculiar way, like, 
coming here, people feel a little less distant or removed from me somehow. So when I walk around signing things or talk to people or you know, I'm gonna interview or whatever, it's like, oh, friends, <laughs> my friends chat, you know? Um, so the vibe is just, it's really great. I mean, you know, I love it here. I'm like a Midwest enthusiast and a Chicago, big Chicago fan. So obviously I live here on purpose. <laughs> Hi, my name is Kristen Zeldra. I'm a writer with the Chicago Marine at the University of Chicago. Um, I'm curious, Ms. Roth, if you had any say in the decision to shoot on the University of Chicago's campus, especially because you're a Northwestern alum and often <laughs> we are considered rivals. No, we're not buddies. Um, <laughs> not so much. Um, and then for anyone else, if you spent time um, on set on the University of Chicago's campus, you could speak to that experience as well. Yeah, you guys moved through there. It's the library. The yeah, Area Day Library. Okay, that library is like Fort Knox. It's so badass. Apparently, they um, you have some like crazy system, right? It's an underground robot that goes and fetches your books. Yeah, it's like very <laughs> Harry really? Potter. Really? Yes. <laughs> it's it's very Harry Potter. Go and you. check it out. I mean, no, I won't. I'm sticking to the Vulcan library. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's really neat. You go in and you type in a little code, apparently, and then it goes. I know, I'd like to picture little, like, gre or not gremlins, what are those Harry Potter goblins? Goblins. Uh, goblins. Elves. Like, uh, they, yeah. Same difference. Come on, I know. <laughs> I picture them in little, like, train cars floating. Yeah, Did you like it? Yeah, I mean, except that they didn't let us have the air conditioning on, so then it was like a big glass bubble that was really hot. So, no, not you, Chicago. They probably would have been fine with us using their air conditioning. But the movie people, you know, with the microphone said you couldn't have the air conditioning on, so we all were sweating all day. <laughs> but it was it was fun anyway, and now it looks beautiful. So yeah. To answer your original question, I didn't have any say in that, but I was pretty excited that they were going to do it, and I really wanted to go to set that day, but it was a uh, it was for some reason conflicting with my schedule. I was like, no, Chicago uh, schools. <laughs> This is for anybody. Uh, if you could play any character besides the character that you play in the film, who would you play and why? Dumbledore, I think. <laughs> <laughs> you mean in Diversion or? In Diversion. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> That's what I thought, and then I was like, oh, wait, no, is that right? <laughs> <laughs> Play erudite extra number two. <laughs> I think it'd be fun to play a Dauntless character, just because you know I didn't get to do any Dauntless training and like I didn't get to do that much fighting or any of that stuff. So it would have been fun to, to play someone in Dauntless and get to do some fighting and some training and stuff. Um, I would choose uh, Peter because <laughs> he's such a smart ass. <laughs> um. Hmm. Maybe Marcus, because he's a, uh, I don't know, he's, he's kind of a complex and uh, he's essentially you know, a flawed person. But then you kind of, you kind of switch between hating him and then kind of empathizing towards his kind of, you know, his whatever he's trying to achieve kind of politically. Actually, I would choose. Uh, she's not in the movie, but I would choose Lynn because she's like punk and cool and like strong and. That's another smart ass. <laughs> I, I love your book. I miss her. I know. Maybe it'll be the second one. Hello, good morning. Hello from Chrissy4.com. First and foremost, congratulations on an epic film. Um, and the question I have is which faction would you least want to join and why? Navigation, I think. <laughs> <laughs> Because they, I don't know, it's kind of, it's, it's quite uh, stifling the atmosphere. I think I think I would uh, struggle with it, and I'd probably make inappropriate comments constantly. And yeah, I'd probably be factionless within a couple of years. Like, out couple of the world. Couple days, maybe hours. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But like, baby, I don't know, Jesus. <laughs> <laughs> I would choose Erida because their outfits look so uncomfortable, <laughs> and because I just that like sterile sort of left brain environment does not suit my lifestyle. I don't think I'd want to be part of Candor. I feel like everyone there are kind of dicks. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. I could like be yeah, everyone being too honest all the time. Sometimes I want someone just. You're nice. pretty honest though. Yeah, but like I'm not. You know, after a while, sometimes like I like just like they're just. But I feel like. 
you know, look at like think about Peter, you know, and like <laughs> even like Christina a little bit in the beginning has to like learn to like shut her mouth a little bit, you know. I feel like yeah. that many personalities that like think that they can say everything that comes to their mind can get annoying. Like tell me some sweet lies, please. Yeah, exactly. uh, for me, Donald's because I would die. Just really, I would die. <laughs> I would rather live than die. So no Donald's for me. I mean, practically speaking. <laughs> Um, I had a question on behalf of the readers of the Loyola Phoenix. They wanted to know what y'all do, uh, what y'all enjoy doing um, during your downtime when you're shooting here in Chicago. Like, what Chicago activities or places did y'all enjoy? Uh, you guys should take this because I enjoy it. We saw some um, uh, some Bulls games. I went to a Blackhawks game. I didn't get to go to the Bulls game. Shit! <laughs> <laughs> and I'm the biggest basketball fan here. Yeah, it's true. But the Blackhawks. <laughs> but we did the Blackhawks. We saw, yeah, yeah, the yeah. Stanley Cup. Uh, oh, we got to see the Rolling Stones. Oh sh yeah, we got to see the Rolling Stones. I did twice. <laughs> <laughs> and Erica Badu. And Erica Badu. Yeah. That was great. And nearly James Blake. Uh, oh. And almost Fleetwood Mac, but that didn't happen today. I went to the Museum Art Institute. That was amazing. <laughs> really, though, that it's cool seeing those. Like, yeah, it's good. Me and uh, Christian kind of woke up. Well, I think it was like one of the, the towards the end, and we had, uh, we were feeling worse for wear, should we say, from the night before. And we wandered the two of us, and just like and it started raining, and we just but we couldn't really because we didn't you know not exactly great metal say We carried on walking. We ended up being at the. Uh, Museum and then the aquarium. It's like two dudes just walking around like zombies. <laughs> that fish, man. <laughs> yeah. I didn't know that. Yeah. Really and weird. then we took the boat back. It was like a weird day. Like, <laughs> 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 you were like, man, daydreaming. Yeah. What happened? Yeah. Uh, Took the old hands. Yeah. It's kind of fun because the, uh, the aquarium is kind of cool. Me and Shaylee would go to the farmer's market sometimes. Oh, yeah, that's true. They have a good farmer's market. market. Yeah. Green City. Yeah, that's true. Yeah. Okay. Um, question for sort of all of you. Um, when you like during uh, production or even now, is there a sense of uh, pressure sort of playing these characters and knowing you're sort of answerable to the fans of the books? No. I mean, I feel like. The second that you try and, if I were to try and, um, you know, create Tris the way that you pictured her, the way he imagined her, the way that she imagined her, it would become a cluster mess of, uh, of a human. And so I think for me it was really about just acknowledging my own intuition as far as who I thought she was. And, um, that was the only way that made sense to me to bring full authenticity to the character and, and be 100% truthful instead of trying to uh, mentalize or think about it, you know, you don't ever want to overthink because then it, it seems like a preconceived character versus somebody who could actually exist in real life. Yeah, you have to make your own choices, you know, because that's your job, essentially. You have to you know, go with your instincts and uh, play the character how you think it should be played by you. <laughs> 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 Um, you guys did a lot of green screen work. What was it like seeing the effects kind of filled in because they were amazing and the Chicago that they designed was amazing. So when you first saw that, what was it like to see that filled in? Pretty epic. I mean, that mirror scene in the beginning, um, that was something that special effects worked on for like two years, a year prior to filming and then they, this entire year uh, after filming. And when we actually, it was the last four days of the, of the film. So it was just me in a room. Uh, the size of a football field of green walls and a green ceiling or stadium lighting. It felt like we were rock stars on stage and then a green floor. And we were in there for four days and you start to lose your mind after a few hours of just being surrounded by green. And so to see it come to fruition was was really neat and I think they did a really good job. I mean, we had to film every single angle. So all of those different churches we actually had to film. And it was very mathematical the way they taped it out on the floor. So it's very interesting to sort of see the process behind green screen, behind CGI, because it's very different from working with another actor. You know, you, it's, it's almost like you have to be a child again and use your imagination because when you're with an actor, you're simply reacting. But when you're by yourself with the green screen, um, you have to imagine a scenario and you have to really put yourself in that in that place. And 
not be afraid to make a fool of yourself because everyone's looking at you in this bare ass room <laughs> doing really bizarre things. Chicago and portraying Chicago to us Chicago and now you're one of the kind of idols or milestones from the city. So you're kind of the ambassador from Chicago? <laughs> <laughs> oh, I don't know. I mean, I feel like if they voted for someone to represent them, it wouldn't be me. Uh, but I mean, I love it here. And when I first saw the movie, the first big shot of the Sears Tower that they, it's the Sears Tower. Yes, anyone? Right? Okay. Um, when they first showed it, I just started to get emotional because it's, this is my home and to, um, I mean, certainly being on set and seeing how many jobs were created in this area and um, <coughs> just how much pride they're all taking in their work. I mean, I'm getting like a little, uh, it was really wonderful. So I love it here and I'm so glad that they shot it here. Um, I know it's, it's hard to shoot things here, so it might not continue, but um, it's really w wonderful to see the city as a city, you know, because we've had movies shot here before, but there were never a set in Chicago. So to see it featured and all of its like beautiful landmarks featured is just like it's like the new Ferris Bueller, really. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Chicago. Yeah. I mean. <laughs> Chicago. It's me. I'm the new Ferris Bueller. No, I don't know. Um, yeah, I don't know. It feels feels so good. Did you guys have any specific favorite parts of the movie that you have seen, or things that you just love seeing from the I am. I love the. When you should take a shirt off. <laughs> <laughs> Definitely not. <laughs> um, I love the, um, the, the zip wire. Me too. I thought that was so cool with that piece of music we were talking about last night. You know, it was just really impressive and, it, yeah, good work, good work. <laughs> I like the Ferris wheel. I thought that's, you know, it's such an epic scene in the book. And then to actually film it was sort of like a dream in a way. I mean, it's just so weird that we climbed the Navy Pier Ferris wheel for 12 hours. It, it was just such an opportunity, you know. Um, but I think that the way that they covered it, I thought it looked beautiful. Yeah. It just sort of nostalgic, like good moments. I like the uh, the scene where, when they're on their way to the zipline. I guess that whole little section movie is awesome. Um, when they're having the fake paintball fight, but not with paintballs, the things that really hurt. Like, well, <laughs> because it's the first time you see four like kick Eric's ass, and you hate Eric so much at the point, you finally <laughs> see him like get taken down a little bit, and like four like shoots him a bunch of times, and you're like, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so. Is Sorry, those are good examples. <laughs> I'm trying to think of a different one. For me, I mean, the, the big emotional scenes that are important. Um, and since they were so well acted, <laughs> it's very good. I also love the pure landscapes, um, especially for zeros, especially when the box is closing. Uh, that was a hilarious. It was a really good line, I think. Uh, it's like, take your time, I'm just being crushed here. <laughs> yeah, that's great. Go ahead, you. My question is for Theo. I'm from uh, Diver I am Diverger.com. With being from the UK, how was it with using the American accent? Was it easy or was it hard trying to attain that? Um, what yeah, what I found with kind of accents generally is that you, you, it's all about the work. You you can't you can't wing it to make it feel as genuine. You know you do have to do the work. And I so I'd stay in accent when I was on set really, and then it kind of bled into the evenings as well. So I just kind of became him in a weird way, um, it, but. Also, I find with the voice, you know, for example, being in action on set, a vo the voice becomes a big part of the character for me, and then how he speaks. And, and so, if I if I slip out of action while I'm on set, and I hear this English dude, I'm like, what the fuck is that? <laughs> um, so, it, and it kind of puts me off. So, I like to kind of be in the space for as long as possible, so that so that I don't have to think about it any time. Because obviously, as soon as you're thinking about something as kind of external and mechanical as an accent or dial uh, dialect, then you're not in the scene and you're not present with the person, so, uh, yeah. Yeah, it's true. I mean, you, when I first met you in the audition, you came in with an American accent, and I remember you said you were British, or somebody mentioned that you was British, and I was like, oh, yeah, huh, that's funny, you're British. Because he, he had an American accent, and after I asked you if you were British, 
you replied yes in an American accent. <laughs> You're right. It was very, just, just gonna, uh, yeah, it was a little confusing. And then you left, and I was like, he's not British. And you were like, yeah, he's so job well done. Yeah, yeah, That was really, one more time. Three times. Uh, did you guys have any, like, running games that uh, you could lose while you were filming? Or, like, do you have any favorite apps or something kind of quiz up? No. <laughs> <laughs> um, I think our games just, yeah. we all have very perverted sense of humor, so that was sort of what kept us just laughing on set, I think. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Uh, <laughs> at the end of, uh, yeah, end of all takes, we'd, uh, you know, be like a really serious scene, and then our favorite thing to do would be say a stupid comment, you know, some sort of intense moment, and then ruin it with a bad He's joke. really good at that. <laughs> Uh, my question is for Ansel. Uh, your character kind of takes on quite a bit more depth in the next couple of books. So is there something you're most looking forward to filming? <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, me and Theo were talking about this last night. Uh, just because I didn't get to do any scenes with him yet. So, uh... Whose fault is that? Yeah. So, you know... <laughs> so, and we were... You know, we, we didn't really get to spend that much time together on the first movie, but like we, we you know we get along the moments we have together, so we, we're sort of like that's that we're looking forward to like the stuff we do uh, beginning of the next story. So.